Hello, record player Scott with you. I have often said that just as important as the live music that we go see is the venue that you go see it at. Uh, I also believe that just as important as the music we listen to is the, uh, the people that are playing it for us and the places that we're listening to it on. Um, today, I'm happy to be joined by a longtime radio voice as well as television personality. Uh, he is the morning host on the, on the number one rated morning show in Toronto, Boom 97.3. Mr. Stu Jeffries is with us. Thank you for joining us, Stu. It's my pleasure. And after an intro like that, I'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> I'll let you know what you need. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a habit of building, uh, building people up. So you, you, you have a lot to, to live up to now. Um, <laughs> I'm a huge fan. <laughs> How have you been keeping uh, during the pandemic family well, everything good? Oh, thank you for asking. Yeah, um, we're, we're well. Um, it was, uh, I've got three boys, um, uh, my wife and three boys, and um, they're, uh, one is in university uh, and one is in grade 12, one grade nine. Um, so, you know, I think if anything, we're lucky that they're at an age where they're, you know, conflict resolution, they've already figured that out if they got past that in their toddler years. So, um, uh, you know, they've got a long, I, I think our, our, our concern was more for them than for us in in terms of how they'd handle being cooped up and not being able to see their friends and all that and would they be at each other's throats and everything and it's turned out to be quite the opposite i mean i we could not have asked for a, a better situation and they're frustrated but they're adapting and but for the most part as we tell them every day uh, you know we're healthy and we're yeah. um we're in good shape and we're following the rules and uh and if we just keep doing this and be patient we'll be okay but you know when you're 19 to 14 or whatever you're not patient about anything um but they have uh, they've impressed us beyond um our expectations and because of that things have been really easy and we've been doing well that's great um when that when everything first started and, and you couldn't be at the studio all of a sudden you're at home and you're working from home how yep. difficult of a transition was that um initially yeah it was probably more um uh, more of a personal thing than a technical thing i mean we were roughing it so the things that you, you know you couldn't do you know things that you had access to in the studio you didn't have access to at home uh, to make things run a little smoother um, I won't say I'm a perfectionist, but I, I like things to run smoothly. And when there's glitches, I um, I feel like I'm, it sounds like super, uh, um, I don't know, corny or whatever, but I, I, I feel like this is my show. I'm letting people down. I can't, I've got to be, I have to have everything working. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I'm not one of those freak out guys when they don't work, it's just a frustrating <laughs> thing. So uh, the first couple of days, it was unique. You know, you get out of bed, you walk downstairs and there's your studio and it was kind of cool. Uh, but it's, I, I felt it's interesting. I work by myself. There's nobody in the studio at work. So the same thing at home. Um, but I felt more of a disconnect with the audience when I was at home than I was at work. And that proved not to be true, but it just seems I'm just staring out my front window and I'm seeing my neighbors walk back and forth and everybody going through their routine. I don't have, I, I just didn't feel a connection, which is odd because if you're, that's connecting like you're right in your neighborhood right doing your thing right in the hood but it felt strange it was hard but i was doing it for about five weeks and i think after the fifth week it was like i'm just ready to get back in just to have the access to all of the stuff that works properly um i'm not i i i kind of i'm i consider myself a bit of a tech nerd but i'm not that great at it um so i'm not able to fix things on the go as much as i'd like to and I'm sure that the things that went wrong, nobody noticed, but it just drove me crazy. Um, but still, like, you know, I'll look back on this and I still do now. You look back on it, you go, this is the oddest, strangest time. <laughs> and we have somehow managed to survive and managed to, um, you know, work around it and immediately. And I love that about our nature. Our nature is, okay, this is what we're faced with. How do we survive? How do we make it work? Uh, and um, and you know we're doing it and i think we've all learned an awful lot of stuff i mean there's stuff that I've oh heard. god yeah yeah um you started your career in uh, in winnipeg your, your radio career in winnipeg um you, you're born in bc but you started in winnipeg where you grew up um i'm from toronto my mm -hmm. thoughts are anyone in winnipeg growing up back then the only thing they wanted to be was either Randy Bachman or Bobby Hull. You wanted to be a rock star, you wanted to be a hockey player. Um, right. How did you get into radio? When did that happen to you that you knew that that's what you wanted to do? 
Well, I'll, I'll I'll tell you first. Well, first of all, I was raised in Winnipeg, but I didn't start my radio career in Winnipeg. I started it in Saskatchewan. But I, I guess the start of the career was at a broadcasting school in Winnipeg, which was the then, um, you know, thriving, I guess, the National Institute of Broadcasting, which had a few, you know, um, uh, schools across Canada. Uh, and uh, I had signed up for that. I had no idea what I was in for, but. Um, I wanted to, uh, like in Winnipeg, when I was growing up, Winnipeg was, um, for me, radio in Winnipeg was the most exciting thing. It captured me when I was about six or seven years old. I have the earliest memories about stuffing a transistor radio under my pillow and, or that really bad one ear white thing that you <laughs> stick in your ear that was so tinny and listening to radio nonstop. And it, it was the music, but it wasn't that. I was all about the jocks and I was all about their presentation and uh, I spent quite a few years, not years, uh, a few weeks every year when I was a young kid with bronchitis, I would spend a lot of time away from school and I would be at home rather than watch TV. I'd be in my bedroom, in my bed, plugged into the radio and just, I'd make my own charts. I'd make my own, like I was just such a geek and I loved it and never thought that um, I could ever do that. I always thought that it was for special people. It was always my thing. I thought, you know, you you can't, it's not for you. There, there are people that have qualifications that do this. You'll never do that. Uh, and then when I found out that it was possible that I could, through some information, I found out about the National Institute of Broadcasting, I immediately jumped on it and uh, borrowed money from everybody I knew to pay for tuition and uh, um, took the course. And then after the course is over, briefly, I guess, I got rejected by, wow, I've, I applied to every small market I could find. And I got rejected by at least a dozen before Yorkton, Saskatchewan said, you want a shot? And the, <laughs> the only reason that that happened was my uh, air check, real to real, real small. Oh, by the way, I uh, I keep this with me all the time. Let me get this. This is my uh, uh, this is my audition from the National Institute of Broadcasting in 1978. <laughs> I keep it on this real to real because I made about 15 of these. This is how you send it out. Well, not cassette had to be on real to real, and I don't know why. Um, so I sent this out to a bunch of stations and um, listen to it. Every <laughs> uh, you know what? It's funny you ask that. I, I, I have found an old reel to reel player and was able to play it back and digitize it just for, you know, uh, just to have just to, to have the memory. And I'm listening to it. I'm going, how did anybody hire me? This is the worst thing that ever happened. Um, but I was lucky that my air check had landed on the desk of a program director in York and Gary Lawrence, who I still keep in touch with every now and then. Uh, who um, through Facebook, who uh, uh, had just fired somebody and my tape just happened to be there. So it was all about timing and uh, got the gig. And then I, I, I moved on from there. Um, you wound up in Vancouver. Did you go from Saskatchewan to Vancouver first? Yeah, it went from, uh, from Yorkton, Saskatchewan to Regina. Uh, and then after about a year and a half in Yorkton, Regina for about six years. And then the Vancouver move happened because of uh, Good Rockin' Tonight when I was offered that. Um, which was totally a, uh, um, a different fork in the road that happened. Just, I had no real interest in TV and I, I still like it, but I, I had no real interest in it. Um, when I was in Regina, there was a posting on a bulletin board in our staff room. Uh, CBC Regina was looking for hosts for a show called The Fame Game. And it was a battle of the bands that each uh, capital city in the province across Canada hosted this show at CBC four bands or eight bands would compete and then they go on to the national finals and so on. So they were looking for a host for the Regina uh, thing. And I've, I was looking at it and kind of shaking my head going, I'm not doing that. And a buddy of mine, Dave Mitchell, who was doing the afternoon show in Regina walked by and he said, I'm going to do that. And if I'm going to do that, you're going to do that too. So I said, okay, fine. And I went and was lucky enough to get that. So I hosted that show and that show unbeknownst to me was um, the tape of that was hung on, or the producer of Good Rockin' Tonight in Vancouver had hung onto that tape or had watched it. And uh, after so Terry that, David Mulligan sorry. left after... Technically, you were mm -hmm. the first host of American Idol, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, that's actually, yeah. And it was, um, yeah, God, it was like, you know, TV compared to radio was like, that was my first real look at, oh my God, like you guys do a lot of waiting, like, you know, and then you do something and somebody comes up to you and said, that was so good. Let's do it again. And you're like, why do we do this over and over? And radio is so, you know, it's done. You say it, it's done, you're finished. Um, so it's so hard to get used to that. And it's just like the taping of the show took forever. Um, 
but yeah and then, so anyway the producer in vancouver ken gibson had had hung on to the tape and when terry david mulligan left the show in 85 uh ken got a hold of me and asked would i be interested in auditioning for that show and i said yeah sure and um i didn't think i'd get it and i got it and that was a nice sort of um a nice sort of different road to travel on for a while and a while ended up being eight and a half years uh but that that prompted the move from regina to vancouver Vancouver. I couldn't, I was flying back and forth. I do my midday show in Regina um, and then Saturday morning, fly out to Vancouver, record Good Rockin' on Sunday and fly back again and do it all over again. So uh, it was getting a bit exhausting. So eventually I moved out to Vancouver and then it was Vancouver to Toronto from there. Um, I want to talk about Good Rockin' tonight a little bit. Uh, sure. <clears throat> you've done that show. Um, I think anybody who's, who's Canadian and, and is of a certain age would remember watching that show. Um, mm -hmm. you, you get onto that show like you said, you took over for Terry David Mulligan. Um, the show was pretty much like entrenched. It was like a couple of years old by the time you- Yeah. Were. What was that like taking over for him? I think he moved on to, I think he went to Much at one point and, and did- He something. went to Much, yeah. Uh, it was um, It was pretty, it was interesting. I, <clears throat> pardon me, I found I wanted to, when I got to Vancouver and I, real, and I got the job, um, it was only a 13 week contract. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and they were high, and they were renewing it 13 weeks at a time. And every so often they would throw a six month renewal. So, you know, you had a little more time and every so often you get a year renewal. So you had a little more time, but because of that, my first instinct when I got to Vancouver was I got to get a radio job mm -hmm. um, so that I can have something to fall back on in case this dies. And um, uh, <laughs> it turned out that every single radio personality uh in seemingly in vancouver toronto across canada had applied for this good rocking job and i had no idea so there was a lot of what's with the kid from regina how does a kid from regina get to host like what the hell happened here um so it was a bit difficult getting a radio job because i think there was a little bit of resentment within the community that you know this was having i'm just guessing but boy it was hard to get a meeting and hard to get a gig and um, and then once the show started going and, and I started getting comfortable, um, you know, things improved in terms of radio and opportunities. This is my first experience at TV and I am, I'm very grateful in my career for a number of things. So one of the things is that I've always been, or have been fortunate to have been on, um, I, I've been fortunate to have been. Uh, working in AM radio when they rocked and it wasn't all talk and it wasn't all oldies or whatever. And it was a, it was a, it was a player. It was a key factor. FM was still relatively new uh, and up and coming for sure. So I was lucky to work in AM when it rocked. And when I went to Regina, I worked at a rock and AM station and it was great. And then I was able to work at FM stations when they were up and coming and it was great. TV, I was able to come in when it was still something where now, you know, everybody's got a TV show. And if it's not on national TV, it's on YouTube or whatever. Uh, and as there's that great line in, that I quote often in the, um, the, uh, the, the Pixar movie, The Incredibles, where the villain basically says, you know, pretty soon everybody will be famous and then nobody will be. And it's like that now, right? Everybody's got a gig, everybody's got a thing. So I was fortunate to be uh, on a national TV show when it was still something, it meant something or was exciting, whatever. And I'm also fortunate that there was no social media then, or they would have ripped me like you would not have believed. I mean, we got letters. People would write in letters, and there were a lot of very nice ones, but there were a lot of ones they wouldn't even let me see, which I saw <laughs> later in my career, which were like, who is this jackass? And get it. Like, it would have killed me. It would have destroyed me. Um, so, yeah, and I, and I had to sort of find my own spot. And Mully was really, Terry was really good to me, and I'll always um, be grateful for that. Whenever I would see him, uh, he was always had nice things to say. And uh, I remember an interview he did for the newspaper saying, well, you're no longer at Good Rock. And what do you think about the new guy? And he said, he's trying to make it his own show. And I think everybody should give him a chance to do that. And I'll never forget that. That was really, really sweet of him. And over the course of eight and a half you know, seasons, I was able to do that. And now I hear back from people, they talk about that show and what it meant to them. And of course, when you're in it, you don't even think about it. But they talk about what it meant to them and how important it was to them when they tuned in on Friday. And if they couldn't be home, they record it. And then they come back home and watch it after a night at the bar or whatever. And I hear that story so many times and it is just like, Oh my God. Like I had no idea. I was like winging it and too young and stupid to even think, you know, that you're <laughs> like, you're anything, you know, important, like you're just doing your thing. Uh, and to hear that now and 
you know, people throw around icon and legend and stuff. And I love that because that just means you're old, but I, I, it's just, it's, it's so nice and heartwarming to know that you had that effect and it was a part of somebody else's upbringing as radio was to mine and TV was to mine when I was growing up. Well, it's funny that you say that because I, when I look back on Good Rock and Tonight, I think of certain memories that I had even just watching right. it because um, I did the same thing. I used to tape it and then come back and watch it afterwards. Um, there, was right. one, there was one time my parents were out, at, out somewhere at a party and I was making out with a girl on the couch watching that show and they came <laughs> home. I'll remember, I'll remember that forever because it was the first time they ever caught me <laughs> that's awesome that's and i can't awesome. i can't listen to the song uh the sting song the uh be still my beating heart for some reason every time i hear that song i think of the first time i saw the video and that was you on think of that moment <laughs> that's awesome so it is true um you did a lot of interviews on that uh on that show obviously with with uh, musicians and singers and stuff um i think i've heard you say this before and and every i follow you on instagram so I, you, you post the picture because uh, you're very proud of it but the paul mccartney interview i'm assuming was your oh was your high i mean yeah <laughs> yeah that um oh man so i it, when i was in regina and still flying back and forth doing good rock and i did a cbc uh it did an interview with me about the you know this jet setting lifestyle that i was leading and um and uh, the woman that was interviewing me said, so what would be your uh, interview? What would be your, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> pinnacle? Yeah. And, uh, and I said, well, a Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits or a Paul McCartney uh, from the Beatles, who I've just been longtime fans of. And I said, you know, I think it would require, you know, a lot of deep breaths and maybe a run around the block before I calm down, before I actually talk to them, because I'm such a huge fan. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to talk to both of them. And they both didn't let me down at all. And the McCartney happened. Uh, the McCartney happened. It was such a whirlwind. Didn't even have time to panic. It was like my producer came into uh, my office in Vancouver and said, "Okay, you're not going to believe this, but we got Paul McCartney. We got a 20 minute interview uh, in Montreal." Uh, and I'm like, "Get out of here!" And he's like, "Yeah, no, we got it." So we flew out to Montreal together. And uh, uh, and this is uh, I remember him, Ken Gibson, my producer, coming to my hotel room. Uh, the day before we were doing the interview to review some questions and we're throwing around a bunch of questions and Ken is saying, you know, well, obviously we got to talk about the Beatles. And I'm like, yeah, for sure. But how many times has this guy talked about the freaking Beatles? Like, I don't, I'll, I was super aware of, I didn't want to piss him off. And, uh, you know, but obviously you got to talk about it. And then, but then how do you talk about it? What do you do and all that? And I'll never forget, we sat down, I shook his hand, we sat down. And the first question I asked him was, um, how do you even get around to a repertoire of what songs you want to sing when you basically have every great song in the entire world that you can pick from, right? So what goes into that sort of process of a set list? He, I'll never forget this, took that question, answered that, and then took me through the entire career of him through the Beatles, through Wings, and to where he was now in like a three minute answer. And I remember, first of all, while well, he started to talk back to me, he answered my question. All I could think of was, holy shit, Paul McCartney. <laughs> holy shit, Paul McCartney's talking to me. Holy shit. And then he answered this question so perfectly. And I thought, okay, well, of course, because you've done it 18 million times. But uh, he was just so, it was like he was explaining it to me for the very first time. And I was so grateful for that because that, you know, you can go the other way. You can say, oh, God, really? You want to talk about that? can we just talk about my new album, you know, or whatever. And like, but he didn't, and he was super gracious. And it made me think over and over again, how many times have you done that, Paul? Like, that's really, really cool. And with Mark Knopfler, it's up there because I love Dire Straits from the first time I heard them. And Mark was, he was just so unbelievably cool and open to anything. And I remember asking this question about the, the pros and cons of success because they got their name Dire straits because they were in dire straits they had no money they had nothing and and if it wasn't for bbc playing sultans of swing when by the way they didn't hear it because they were they were <laughs> they were doing part-time work as a moving company moving furniture so they never heard the first time the record got played and i talked to him about that i said so the pros and cons of success he goes oh there are no cons he says i recommend success to everybody <laughs> he says it's awesome and i thought i love that honesty that's so cool it's like he says i can do anything i want I can buy anything I want. I can play anything I want. I have the freedom to do that. So yes, I recommend success. There are no cons to success. I thought that's, <laughs> that's beautiful. That's great advice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, out of all the people that you interviewed, are you, do you still have some, some of them that you're still friendly with that you became close to over the years? Yeah. Um, 
you know, certainly Corey Hart, uh, who is just such a great guy and such, and I, I don't know if Corey ever, um, I don't want to say got the credit. Uh, I just don't think anybody realized what a spiritual guy Corey is and what a, what a really um, grounded, cool man he is. Um, uh, and, you know, I guess, yeah, there are a few others. I sort of, I, I made the mistake early on of um, when I interviewed some people that I knew um, uh, going up to like, uh, for example, Tom Cochran, Red Rider, who I'd interviewed a few times before I even got the good rocking job. And he was always quite supportive of me. Um, uh, I find then you can't ever be friends because in my mind, I thought we're buddies so I can go into this interview and we'll just kind of hang out. Right. And sometimes that doesn't work that way. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes people are like, you know, no, it's not a friendship. This is sort of a professional relationship. And it, and you, you kind of, <laughs> I, it's a story I have difficulty getting into because I remember at the time it happened, it really, it was, it hurt my feelings. And um, I realized that you can't always be friends with the people that you think you're friends with, particularly in this industry. So let's just leave it at that. Um, uh, but uh, having said that, there are some who just, you know, you see and it just brings a smile to you right away and you immediately go back to those times. Alan Frew and the guys from Glass Tiger always. Whenever I talk to those guys, it's always like, oh man, so cool. It's a great to see you again. It's like we're, um, it's like you get together maybe once every three months, six months, a year or whatever, but it's like it all comes flooding back and you have just a great time and a great laugh. Uh, yeah, and, I um, saw, I but saw I realized- I saw the interview that you did uh, more recently with Alan after he got sick, after he had the strokes, right. and that was a great interview. And you guys seemed like you yeah. were, you know, friends. And... Yeah. Oh God, yeah. And he was, it was so good to see him healthy. And and um, but I, regarding the the connection in the interview, um, there was a long, <laughs> a long while. It's good. It was I guess ninety, maybe eighty nine, ninety, maybe a little later. Uh, we were invited down to Los Angeles to go to the Queen Mary, uh, the ship to um, celebrate Queen. Uh, the group who had just signed with um, uh, Disney's record label. Uh, and it was a big thing. So I had invited Brian May down to Roger Taylor. And this is when Freddie really knew he was sick. Uh, so Freddie didn't make the trip. So Brian and Roger were there. And uh, we got to fly down uh, to Los Angeles to interview them. And then uh, we would go to the Queen Mary, celebrate the signing of the records, the Hollywood records. And then they put on this huge fireworks show for Bohemian Rhapsody, which is it's still, I can still see it now, it was incredible. Uh, but before that happened, we got the interview with Brian May. And Brian was unbelievable and so great to talk to. And I can't even remember half the things we talked about. And he was clearly in pain too, because he knew Freddie was sick and he wasn't going to be around long, right? And he was, but still unbelievably forthcoming. And uh, we didn't talk about Freddie and because I, I didn't even know Freddie was sick. Uh, but at the end of the interview, Brian said, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed that Stu thank you so much it was a pleasure talking with you I look forward to seeing you it's so nice and I thought yeah me and Brian we made a connection uh so <laughs> that night on the Queen Mary there were my camera guys and everything Tony Wanamaker from Much Music he'll he remembers this very well uh, uh Queen is introduced Brian May and Roger Taylor are introduced and they're walking down this 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 little red carpet area with the velvet rope between us and them and I see Brian come up to me and I hold out my hand again to shake his hand. Like, Hey, Brian, it's me. Remember me? You know, <laughs> he hands me his empty glass and says, I'll have a vodka and orange juice, please. <laughs> like, oh my God. Oh my God. I remember like my, I could feel like, you know, that rush of blood to your head. And it's like, he thinks I'm a waiter. He doesn't remember anything. And I told that to Tony <laughs> camera guy and, and Wanamaker said, Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, and his publicist was like, sorry. So I was just kind of hanging out there to dry, holding Brian May's empty glass and go get him another drink. I had no idea what to do. I would have given him another drink. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that to me was like the ultimate, you know, you think you make a connection. You might think you make a connection, but these guys do this a thousand times a day. Like there's no way they're going to remember you from one day to the next. That was a hard lesson to learn, but funny. Um, the, the, the show, uh, you were there for eight, nine years. Um, it ends... Mm -hmm. Uh, at that time, there's there's other shows. There's I think Video Hits was going on with Samantha Taylor at the time. Right. I'm not sure if mm -hmm. uh, Toronto Rocks was done when, by then. Um, I think it was it was still going for a while. I know Video Hits went for a while. I think we I think Video Hits and I and our show got canceled at the same time. I think within days. I think we both kind of lasted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then much music was it was it just 
was it oversaturated? Was there just too much going on at the time? Yeah. And that, yeah, I and I think um, with Good Rock and they, um, what they did, which I liked, was they expanded. They became sort of rather than a video show, they became a rock journal. They went to call themselves a rock journal. Uh, so we would go on movie junkets and try and supply this all around video entertainment package that included not only your interviews with your favorite music stars, but movie stars as well too. bring you the latest movies, that sort of thing, uh, which introduced the junket sort of aspect to, um, to the show. Uh, and I think really after a while, it was just the proliferation of all of that in the market. There was no need for it anymore. So I get it. Um, we uh, were so proud of that show and everybody involved in it because, you know, they were talking about as far as a variety show in CBC Vancouver, the only one that went longer than that and 25 years was Beachcombers. And we were pretty proud of that. And these days, you don't see a show lasting too long, right? It doesn't matter how great it is. It's got a, it has a shelf life. It has a shelf life as soon as the first, first show airs, even though even if it doesn't know it. Um, so I'm really, really proud of that. And, and that we also went out, I won't say we went out on top. We were never a, a super highly rated show, but we were a popular show. Mm -hmm. So um, even though it didn't have the numbers, it doesn't make sense. Even though it didn't have the numbers, it had the viewers and it had the eyeballs that maybe uh, didn't show up in ratings. And, and I think because of that, it, it, had a, uh, it had a really good run. And we also, as our producer in Vancouver said, um, the Mountains Act is a great boundary. There were times where we were convinced that Toronto had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> Just let us do whatever we want to do. You know, yeah, you guys are good out there. Way to go. Uh, and I think that worked to our, to our benefit. So, yeah, I'm so, I'm so proud of uh, the time that that show was on the air and proud that, um, you know, I wasn't a one trick pony host and was able to be there for eight and a half seasons. Right. I, I you know, and, uh, and I never see another camera lens again. I don't care. I mean, it was a lot of fun and I'm, I'm really proud of it. Um, I, when you, after Good Rock and Tonight, you did, you did a few other uh, television bits. You did uh, the sports shows. Mm -hmm. Um, you did a kid's show called Switch. Right. Um, what I want to right. talk about, and the one that I remember the most, is uh, the game show, the the Love Handles. Um, love that Handles, was, right? That yeah. was hilarious. And and for you, to, to me, it was for those who don't remember, it was a dating game, newlywed mm -hmm. show type uh, type thing. Um, it it takes a personality to be a game show host, and you do the same thing on your show now. You're part comedian, you're part you know announcer. You're uh, right. what was that? What was that? Uh, like you guys were a groundbreaking show other than the fact that it was like the dating game but what was that show? right that was probably I say this to this day and still mean it probably the most fun I had doing television switchback I had a ton of fun too with that but um the game show first of all it was the first game show to feature same-sex couples and I'm super proud of that and that was the thing that I think everybody jumped on at first uh was how is that going to work that's so that's strange um uh are you going to show them kissing like all these really weird questions about this like yeah well of course they're a couple so yeah we're good um but the producer of that show Blair Murdoch uh has has a ton of shows on tv that are still running right now and Love Handles is still running right now I know it was on the Pride Network for a while something I'm super proud of uh and he does meatball television it is like I am going to churn out show after show after show and they are going to run till the end of time. I'm going to buy you out. I'll pay you well, but I'm going to buy you out and I don't ever want to hear from you again. And I remember when he asked me if I would be interested in doing the show and I said, sure. And he told me all the details and he gave me the contract. And I remember I came back to him with a couple of questions <laughs> on the contract. I can't remember what it was. And he goes, okay, so we're we good. And I said, yeah, sure, fine. He said, he said, okay, so sign there. And that sound you hear is your career being flushed down the toilet. <laughs> and I was laughing so hard that oh my god and he made that show what it was he brought out the uh the um uh, i don't even know the i guess the hidden game show host or the inner game show host in me that i never knew i had and we had so much fun doing it uh david k is a um, um worldwide voiceover guy who has done um name a name a cartoon character on national tv Dave's responsible for one of those voices. He was so good. And he was the announcer on that show. Um, and we, God, we had so much fun. And with Blair, he made it like the contestants could not see Blair, but I could see him. And what he hated most was if I asked a question and all three of them said the same thing for an answer, he hated that. And what he would do is walk behind the camera where they couldn't see them, but I could see him and he'd go, what's going on <laughs> and you try to keep a straight face and try and continue to do the job with him 
he, I don't think I've ever enjoyed working with somebody more than Blair. And, uh, and every time I see that show and I do see it and people do bring it up, um, I see all those suits I was wearing from Maximilian and <laughs> had the big head of hair and all that stuff. And it was just like, it just takes me back to, um, I don't know, you know, I guess it's like, I am insanely proud of everything I've done. Uh, sure, I've done some embarrassing shows and I don't care. Uh, it was all part of the learning process and all part of, you know, thought process. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm so proud of of not just the stuff, but the relationships that I built with the people that, you know, went with that. And um, yeah, I can I can watch that. <laughs> I've seen clips and people send me clips of love handles all the time. Of course, I have no memory of it. And <laughs> the taping schedule, insane. So I'm doing the morning show in Vancouver. I finish at nine, go to UTV in Vancouver to tape six shows a day for the entire month. So Monday to Friday, I'm working like from three o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night doing these shows. And I'm looking at it and they're funny and fun and all that stuff. And I'm thinking I could barely stand on my feet. It was so tired, but I think that also made it the way it was. I mean, everybody was giddy and punch drunk and all that. So it was all really good. I, yeah, I love that show. Um, I want to skip to head to, you mentioned Toronto. You, you wind up in Toronto. Um, you worked at a couple of radio stations in Toronto uh, before you, mm -hmm. you got to Easy Rock. Um, right. When, when, or when you get to Easy Rock, uh, you, in the morning show, it was before Boom, obviously 97.3, same, right. same, same uh, station, but uh, before they changed mm -hmm. the Boom, and you worked with Colleen Rushholm in the morning. Um, right. Was that... Um, was that kind of, when I think of everybody, I'm probably Toronto ignorance, but to me, everywhere in the country, everybody wants to get to Toronto. Everybody wants to be in Toronto to do yep. a show. Is that, is that the yep. way it was and you felt like you were here now? Yes, and that was my goal. My goal was always that uh, in radio was um, I want to be doing, and you know, people that I've been friends with over the years will bring that up to me all the time. He said, that's all you could talk about. And I don't even remember doing it, but it was such a focus of mine uh, to not only be in Toronto, um, to be in the number one market in Canada, but to to do mornings and then to be successful at it. And so uh, when Colleen and I came over from Country 95.3, which was broadcast heavily into Toronto, but Hamilton based and a country station that, although was incredible, um, and I mean, a solid country station just could not make any, um, even if people in Toronto were listening to country, they were too cool to admit it. So it was really hard to make any sort of inroads there. Uh, so when Easy Rock came and that opportunity came, Colleen and I went and um, I remember that feeling of just like, God, I'm in market one and now I'm doing mornings and this is it. And then immediately realizing the competitive nature uh, of the market and and also how uh, heritage works. Um, because when you're new, it doesn't matter what kind of show you have. You could have the best show in the world, the worst show in the world, whatever it's gonna take a long time before people realize that you're there. Um, everybody says, you know, it takes five years to build a good morning show and to build on it and make it better. And yet for the most part after three years, which is really usually what contracts are, um, if you're not showing any inroads, it's like, ah, sorry, let's go with another show and we'll try and build it up again, which doesn't make any sense because you want a heritage show, but you're not gonna get a heritage show if you don't let them, you know, work it out. However, when businesses take over radio stations are sold there's new owners there's new everything i understand everybody's got a, everybody has a, a, a as an idea of how things should go and whenever there's a sale or a takeover of some kind you know doesn't usually play well you know you're probably if you're not solid you're probably not going to stay there right and colleen and i were uh, mid-pack at best um we had a great show uh, in my opinion uh, but we just you know it these things take time and we were going up against, you know, Aaron Davis and Mike Cooper, who had tremendous heritage and and Roger Rick and Marilyn. I mean, God, a chum. It was just like, you know, we were battling. We were new and we were battling those giants. It's like, forget it. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, that didn't work out for me so well uh, when uh, it was sold to Astral. Um, but then, you know, I, I wasn't my contract wasn't renewed and um, I was kind of on the outs. And that was a good period for me to realize how much I loved it and how much I wasn't about to let it slide and how much I was not going to go anywhere else. And I was blessed to have offers across the country, which was great, but there was no way I was leaving Toronto and there was no room for me in Toronto morning. So I had to try and figure something out. And, um, you know, I just kind of threw a series of different things. I did the 80s show with Kim Clark Champness and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I went back, I did weekends 
Uh, and boy, that's humbling because you're like, wow, you know, I'm in my 35th, 36th year of doing radio and I'm doing weekends. I got to, you know, but I loved it and I didn't want to give it up and I didn't want to give the opportunity up. And then one thing led to another and uh, another sale, another format change, uh, another opportunity. And I remember when there were changes made in the morning show at Boom, um, my program director, uh, Chris Abbott said, okay, we're going to put you in there. Uh, Chris was from Los Angeles and didn't know anything about my career. So I, you know, he didn't know about me or anything like that. So that was cool. And he gave me a chance. He said, you know, we're going to put you in there, but we're not looking for, it's not going to be a morning show. It's going to be a lot of high energy, a lot of phone requests, a lot of stuff like that, a lot of music. And I remember thinking, oh, that's not very exciting. And could I possibly work within those confines to make it better? So any opportunity, and this is the thing, I, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, fortunate enough to be raised on radio in the 70s, AM radio, where all those jocks did all their business over the intros, and they were given nothing in terms of time to talk when the songs were over going into commercial breaks. So whatever you had to say, it had to be condensed, but it better be damn good. And I remember I was raised on that. So it was sort of like, okay, man, I don't have much room to talk, but I'm using every opportunity I can here with every space I have to fill every second with some sort of content and dug it like it was so much fun um and then things just started happening like you know I, I got a little more leeway i got a little more opportunity to do this and that. i'm convinced to this day although no one would ever tell me i'm convinced i was keeping the seat warm for an idea that was yet to hatch i thought somebody else was out there somewhere that was going to take my place but i was like you know okay if you're going to take my place fine but you're going to have to drag me out of here and i'm going to make it hard for you i'm going to work hard um and then things just started happening and then you know, ratings started just increasing, but ever so slowly, but up all the time. We never had this, never had those spikes. It was always just a very steady increase. And then, you know, with Steve Parsons and Steve Jones, uh, guys who I love, Troy McCallum, who I love, gave me the opportunity to open up and be uh, who I am. And um, I was able to, um, you know, with that and with that support, able to turn it into what it is now, which is, again, something I'm incredibly proud of. We're, we're doing well and you know, it wasn't supposed to be that way. I'm convinced it wasn't supposed to be that way. But oh my God, here we are eight years down the line. And look, I've got a heritage show. Who to thunk it, right? <laughs> he said three, if you just wait beyond three years and give it some time and it's good, you know, something might happen. Well, it's like you said, and there, and there are so, every radio, every radio station has like such turnover when it comes to morning shows. Um, the only, yeah. my, my friend, my friend, Craig Venn, who, uh, who I've known forever, um, mm -hmm. he's been on the same station for a while. And of course, Derringer, but other than that, it's kind of a turnover, turnover, turnover. It um, is. And you don't, you don't get that, you know, I understand it. And then I don't understand it. You know, I understand that there's the business behind it. I totally get that. And you're spending so much money and we're not getting results, but it's sort of like, wow, it's a, it's a two-way thing, right? You want results. Well, it's going to take time. We don't have the time. Okay, well, what are we going to do? You know, you kind of hope to catch lightning in a bottle, and boy, that doesn't happen that often. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, your charitable work, the stuff that you do on Boom, uh, whether it be the the you're heavily into the anti bullying. Um, you you mm -hmm. do the the Make a Wish Foundation, which isn't just at Christmas time. It's the, obviously that's the push to make as much money as possible. Um, but uh, right. so that's a year round thing from the contest on the show. Yeah. Um, and that didn't start out that way, which is really cool. So we were in our, I guess it's our fifth year last year. Uh, and how about this during a pandemic? Yeah. Um, we raised, uh, we went in with a goal of 150,000 and we were all like, you know, we're going to have to work for it. Uh, but hopefully we can get close to that. Well, we blew past that and blew past two and then 250 and whatever. And over half a million dollars raised during a pandemic just this last year to put us over a uh, million dollars since the campaign started. And when the campaign started, we, it was the almost the end of, or the beginning of December and we had money and we were sort of like, what can we do with this money? Who can we give it to? And somebody came up with the idea of make a wish. Uh, and so we threw it out there and managed to raise, we said, well, let's just grant a wish, <clears throat> pardon me, or a couple of wishes for 20,000 bucks. Right. Uh, and we thought, okay, that's pretty cool. And we ended up granting four for 40,000. But I remember sitting in uh, uh, Steve Parsons office and he says we should be embarrassed by that. He said we're a, a number one radio station. We have listeners everywhere, and we could only do that. Let's put some more thought into it, a little more time into it next year, and let's go. And and we did, and so it just went up and crazy from there. And then, but it's it's the people, 
it, I say this all the time, I'm overwhelmed and yet not surprised, but still like, oh my God, people will play the contest and say they win 70 bucks. And it might not sound like much, but 70 bucks is 70 bucks to somebody. Somebody could use that money, right? Maybe they didn't get the grand, they got 70. They don't hesitate. They say, let's give it back to make a wish. Mm -hmm. And because they did that, whether it's 20, 40, 70, 80, 60, whatever, that adds up. And when we pop the lid on that pot, when we begin the campaign in December, this year was like over $30,000. We granted three wishes over the years and we're never telling people to give the money back. They just do. Yeah. So it's like, holy crap. And it's something that people I think can really um, sink their teeth into. I know as a parent, I mean, I compare, when I hear about wish kids, I compare their ages to my kids and go, oh God, I am so lucky. Yeah. And here during a pandemic, here are wish kids and we're waiting to take their trip to Disneyland or waiting to, to fly somewhere or go somewhere and they couldn't, they're grounded because of the pandemic. And some of them didn't make it. And some of them had rush wishes, like what they call rush wishes, which means it's not looking good. We've got to do something. And it's heartbreaking, but people feel that. And, and this year more than ever, I felt this sort of, um, this feeling that people had that they want to give, they just didn't know what to do. Like, where can I, I want to give, I want to help. What can I do? How can I help? And they came out of everywhere. And when we went past half a million, I was like, everybody in the room was like, oh my God, this is crazy. So, um, you know, I, I, and I feel that that's when, at least for me, that's when radio is at its best, when it is, um, when it's connecting, but also when it's helping. And like, and I want to be, that's how I want to go out. I want to go out helping. I want to go out um, making uh, a difference that way. And um, I, I mentioned proud, so proud. I'm so proud of many things. I, I think that's at the top of the list though. I, I, the Make-A-Wish work is incredible. And with anti-bullying, I'm fortunate to uh, work with people, as I mentioned before, that give me the leeway to tell the stories. And um, I, I've been able to do that. And, uh, and because of that, um, it's, it's created a connection with an audience, with my audience that, uh, um, I value and um, and I'm am very very proud of, just because I've had the opportunity to do it. And if they don't allow me to do it, it doesn't get done. And they do, and and I think we make a difference. <clears throat> well, you certainly do. I get all choked up talking about this. No, it's okay. And you know what? You have to be pretty proud of that. The radio. I think a lot of people don't understand just the power that radio has. I mean, right? So uh, it's true. We have uh, we we have a and an, an obligation too, and we can be better. You know, we can be, we're not, we, it's, it's not always about, it's part of it, but it's not always about the dumb joke or not always about the ha ha or not always about the sports score or whatever. It's about what, you know, you're, I have you, you're in the car or you're at home and I have you listening to me. Well, what am I going to do? That's going to make that an experience for you. Right. What am I going to do? That's going to make that interesting or, or, or valuable to you. And um, I think about that all the time. And, you know, you can spot a show that mails it in a mile away. You can spot a show that, you know, has just been doing the same thing for years and years. Um, and real quick, I had a, uh, you know, a, a, an intern that was working with us about three, four years ago. And her uh, mission, somebody asked her, said, create a, create a little blurb for our website about each person's show here at the station. And I didn't even know who she, I had never met her and she had never met me. I don't think she ever listened to the show. And but she said, I remember the blurb, she said, Stu Jeffries has the most fun in the morning with news and traffic and just a hint of celebrity gossip. And I remember reading that going, well, no, that's not what I do, but I totally get that because that's what everybody does, right? Like that's the description of every morning show everywhere. And I remember reading that going, I, I don't want to be that. Like, no, man, no. Like <laughs> it, there could be more and yet it doesn't have to be anything like really super highbrow, but just you know, something with a little bit of thought and a little bit of feeling and a little bit of love to it, boy, that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm handing him somebody's resume right now, but uh, there's a young girl, who, <laughs> there's a young girl who used to work for me a long, long time ago, um, who's just starting out her radio career. She's in Thunder Bay right now. Um, right. Her name's Kelly Gill, just in case she never, uh, <laughs> um, she's, she's fantastic. She's very talented. Uh, if there's one thing that I could give her a piece of advice of who to model herself after it would be you. I mean, you're, you're, oh. you're, you're, you're funny, you're, you're, you're charming, but you're also very professional. And, uh, and it's, a, it's an, uh, I'm so happy that you were able to talk to us today. Um, if, 
again, like I said, if, if I was ever to have her, have her, you know, sort of look at, listen to someone and say, that's who you want to be like, it's, it would certainly be you. I'm, I'm so glad to. Oh, uh, thank you. That's like, God, you just made my night. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm like, this is <laughs> it's not very good. It's, uh, it, I mean, it, I'm glad, I'm glad that I, I, I get to do what I love and I'm glad that it has that kind of effect. And, uh, you know, when you say she's starting her career in Thunder Bay, man, I'm like, fingers crossed, go get them. It's like <laughs> such an exciting time, right? Like it's really exciting and there's fewer opportunities now than ever. You know, nobody has an all night show anymore where you can cut your teeth and, you know, M Magoo, Manitoba or whatever. It's all gone. <laughs> Everything is all voice tracked or whatever. So whenever you see that and I hear somebody going to a small market, I'm going, yeah, go get them. This is it. This is where you learn all the shit. And then you get out of there and you're like, you know, you're the better person for it. So um, I send her all my love and all my and the, and the best of luck, too. And if there's anything that I could ever do to help out, please have her reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to uh, to help her along if that's what she needs or even just to be there for her to, you know, be a sounding board because I never had one and I would have loved one. <laughs> just like everybody else, her goal is to make it in Toronto mornings. So absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for being with Go us. Get I it. appreciate the time. Uh, I hope you and your family stay well and I hope we talk down the road. Right back at you. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Take care, Stu.